The following interview was conducted with William E. Moore, Southern University System D Distinguished Professor of Chemistry, Ph.D. in Physical Chemistry from Purdue in 1967 for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place <clears throat> on Thursday, October 28, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good morning, Professor Moore. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Let's start off. Tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years. I, I was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Uh, uh, I have uh, both of my parents are deceased now. Uh, uh -huh. uh, son of uh, Howard Moore and Madeline. Uh, have four brothers, uh, one who's deceased. Mm -hmm. uh, and I grew up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Did you go to grade school and high school there? Yes. Well, tell us a little about that, about grade school and high school. Any clubs and things that you participated in? Uh, grade school was an interesting experience. Uh, uh, I had some very instructors, uh, teachers who were very strong disciplinarians. Uh, I, in the early elementary grades, I think I received a solid education, uh, uh, participated in some activities, not a lot in the early elementary grades as I can recall, other sure. than things like uh, a little theater. I remember that and I remember uh, my principal uh, during those years remembered it long after I was in uh, college. He would call me by one of the characters of a play at, I was in in the third grade. So that was kind of memorable in that in that sense. Sure. Uh, in uh, middle school or what we called junior high school at that time, I, I was a bit more active. Uh, primarily though, uh, sort of a trivia buff and, and a spectator sports activist. I did, uh, I did win a spelling bee in the seventh grade. Uh, and so I, I was quite involved uh, in extracurricular activities at that time. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> when I moved to high school, uh, I was uh, ambitious about being an athlete, but I wasn't tremendously uh, good. I did play a little uh, basketball and football, uh, and uh, I also uh, uh, played uh, sort of community baseball, and that was the extent of it. I didn't uh, play in any more sports. I, I wasn't a musician, so I didn't play in the band. Sure. I had a brother who was a musician who uh -huh. played in the band. Sure. And, and basically that was it. I, I, uh, I began to stress, well, throughout my whole life, I have had an inclination toward uh, learning about things, and so uh, that sort of permeated all of my uh, experiences, grade school and high school experiences. So I never made a great decision, though, about what I wanted to do. Uh, I, For some reason, I, I knew that I didn't want to be a medical doctor. I, I kind of ruled that out, and for some very strange reason, I just didn't think that I could f confront the idea of losing patients, and that sort of moved me away from from that as a an aspiration. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I finished at the top of my class. A very small school, though. Mm -hmm. I finished at the top of my class, and I, I, when I went to college, I wasn't quite sure. I uh, I don't know how to say this with modesty, but I was pretty good in a lot of subjects. Sure. And, trying to decide on where to. Right, and so I, I went through my first year of college not knowing exactly yeah. what I wanted to do. Uh, I, I, I knew I had an inclination toward science. I was very good in English, though. Uh, in fact, in the final analysis, my English grades were slightly better than my chemistry grades. So that, that was an idea. I thought I wanted to teach, and that was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. How did you have to decide to go to Southern? Uh, that's where you got your back. Well, uh, that that's an interesting story in its own right because uh -huh. I I started to uh, to school at Alabama A and M, okay. and I was there for a year, and uh, there was a person who became chemistry department head who had gone 
who had gotten his degree in the agriculture school here, but he took a lot of chemistry in the department, in the department, even While though he was, he, was, he was in ag biochemistry. And so he decided he wanted me to go with him because he was going to become the head of the chemistry department at Southern. That person was Vanden White. Okay. And uh, I was determined not to go. I, I, was, uh, I, I was very satisfied with where I was and with what I was doing. And he had had the occasion to teach me one course and decided that he was going to take me and two other students with him. And I just refused to even Thanks. begin to accept that. And then he, I, I moved in with my uncle in North Alabama between, between the summer term and the fall term, and he literally found me. He found where I was living, came to get me, he and made one, <laughs> made one final plea to bring me to Southern, and I relented, even though I came kicking and screaming. I relented uh, for a while and then agreed that to come. So that's how I got to Southern. It was okay. under the influence of Vanden White, who, by the way, had a strong influence in my coming to Purdue as well. Good. Okay. What, uh, tell us about campus life, and uh, you took chemistry and some other courses there, and you lived on campus? Uh, at Southern? Southern, uh-huh. Uh, yes, I lived on campus. Okay. Uh, uh, I had, a, I had some, some very impressive professors who, who uh, gave me a lot of uh, attention with mentoring and, and uh, with undergraduate research supervision. So I, so I felt pretty good about my undergraduate education. I had the occasion to spend one summer at Tulane University with uh, a professor there. Well, I was really at Dillard University in New Orleans, but the professor was a professor at Tulane, uh, Dr. Jan Hama who passed away recently, but mm -hmm. uh, that was a good experience oh, yeah. uh, for me. And uh, so all around, uh, in every sense of the word, I think that my undergraduate experience was good. In fact, in retrospect, it was a little better than my high school experience. Okay, uh, and uh, so uh, I became a chemistry major by virtue of my going to so, Southern with Dr. Right. White. and. Uh, and it worked out. Uh, it worked out very well. Well, here comes my senior year, and I have to, to make a decision. I had applied to the University of Illinois and uh, Michigan State, had not applied to Purdue, and uh, Dr. White discovered that. Uh, <laughs> he and, is your mentor. Yes, he discovered that, and uh, he said that he wanted me to consider going to Purdue. I think his, his language might have been a little stronger than that, but he wanted me to consider Strong going to, uh, to, to Purdue. And I had already received an, an assistantship from the University of Illinois. And I said, I like that. And of course, I knew Illinois had a good chemistry program. And so he got on the phone, Dr. White did one day, and called Dr. Earl McBee, who was the head of the chemistry department at that time. Mm -hmm. That was in 1963, mm -hmm. spring of 63. And in that telephone conversation, Dr. McBee offered me an assistantship over the phone. And that was it. That, that sort of solidified my decision okay. uh, to come. And so, I, and I'm happy that I did. They said, so some of my fellow undergraduate colleagues said, aha, you're going to Purdue. That's the MIT of the Midwest. And I think that one person actually said, sort of in uh, uh, a joking manner, you know, they are very serious there. The basketball players study chemistry at halftime. <laughs> and so that, that sort of uh, These things stick in your mind, yes, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, well then, so then you, did, you stayed on, got the PhD then while you were here. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. I, I, uh, I came in in '63, mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. McBee was the head. Was still the head. Was the head. Was, of the, was the head of the department. Sure. He was the head of the department uh, at that time. Uh, I worked with uh, Joseph Foster, okay. who later became head yeah, of the at department. One time. That's right. Uh, and uh, had a good experience working in his laboratory, and uh, it turned out to be a, a good undergraduate experience. Uh, experience. I, I mean, graduate experience. Right. I'm sorry. I was on, 
I was on target. We had qualifying exams that uh, during that period, and I passed my qualifiers on the first round, and then uh, when, we, when we took the prelim exam, I passed that on the first round, and that was a cause for a great celebration. So I, I had one of the biggest parties that a graduate student could afford at that time <laughs> on, on passing my prelims. Uh -huh. and, and then uh, in 1967, uh, I okay. completed my graduate work right. and uh, got the. Were you the, married at that time? Yes. Okay. So my wife Willow was here with me okay. during the full during the full time. Did you so work? we've been married for. Uh, we got married in '63, so I think that's 47 years Something according like to my that. math. That's wonderful. Which was the same year that I entered graduate school. Okay. And Did so, she work while she was at Purdue? She uh, yes, she 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 uh, she started out uh, teaching. She couldn't get a job here. She was in high school science, so she taught for a year in Indianapolis, and that was at uh, Crispus Attucks High School in Indianapolis. Okay, and then moved here and uh, got a job in the organic chemistry laboratory, uh, working for Dr. Henry Foyer. Oh, sure, and. Uh, she, uh, so she stayed in there, and she got uh, in that position until she got uh, pregnant in uh, '66, and then uh, she took care of the child. Right, right, right. Who was your major professor? Joseph Foster. Oh, he was. Okay, right. mm -hmm. okay, okay. He Who, has, he, he since passed away, though. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, right. at, at an early age, he uh, well, relatively early age. That's right. At that time, I thought he was in greater physical condition than I was as a graduate student. Huh. And he, 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 he was very adamant about that. Uh, but he pa passed away at 56. That's right, uh, I remember reading about it in the paper. Okay, let's, then after you finished, then you went back to Southern University. Now tell us a little bit about some of your initial appointment and the research. And yes. you got promoted in a short period of time. That's right. That's uh, wonderful. Uh, uh, early. Uh, uh, well, I was full professor. I went there in '67, okay. and I was full professor in '72. Yeah, that's wonderful. Because I, at that time, I was contemplating, looking probably at other sure. options which had come available, and the president uh, didn't want that. So that eventually led to uh, the promotion, promotion, right. and uh, a modest a salary increase. But but I went there in '67. And I, uh, well, I had aspirations about starting a research program, and uh, I guess, uh, but I, you know, I had to work through the uh, the procedure of of doing that and getting some small external support. And I, and I never will forget that in '69 I had a small research grant from Eli Lilly. Uh, for five thousand dollars, and that was really the beginning of my uh, research experience. I was had played around the laboratory for the first two years, but basically I went away for the summers. I I went to Charles Pfizer for one summer, and went to uh, uh, CPC International, which was Corn Products at that time for a second summer. So I didn't really get focused until '69, and and from there on I. I began to get federal funding and and had a good undergraduate research program going, uh, uh, and that was basically it. We we had a master's degree at Southern, but my emphasis was on undergraduate research, and I, I and I saw that as being important at that time, and I still see it that right. way today. Right. What was your specific research focus? Can you tell us what that would have well, been? Well, uh, I, I focused. I, I stuck with albumin at, at when I got my PhD at Purdue. I was studying the stability of serum albumin, and uh, I used uh, physical methods for doing it, uh, primarily uh, denaturation studies and using physical methods to characterize the albumin we were studying. And so when I when I got to Southern, I started to thinking about well, there are some other dimensions of albumin that I can look at, including uh, the aging of albumin, which is again related to stability, but it was a very good way to get started, and that's where I started. Okay. Uh, later, I got into uh, 
to other proteins. I, I was always a protein uh, right. chemist. Okay. So I got into other proteins and began to look at some of the vegetable proteins, uh, especially the soy proteins and uh, the binding capability of various types of foodstuffs to vegetable proteins and how that would actually lead to some of the qualities that consumers enjoy, such as texture and sure. all of that. So it, it took me in a slightly different direction. Right. Yeah. But some of the basic things that I had learned at Purdue, I, I still applied them to the systems right. I was working And as you said a moment ago, you really a you undergraduate research. Yes, very yes, good yes. I had, I had one, I had two uh, master's students uh, before I uh, went back to Southern as an administrator. Okay. One of them went on to do very well and uh, got his PhD. Now he, he, he was uh, a master's student when I was at Norfolk State. By the way, I spent five years at Norfolk State oh, as you. State University as chair of the chemistry department. Okay. And this student was a student that I picked up. We didn't have a master's program there, but I had a joint appoint appointment with Old Dominion, which allowed me to have master's students in my lab. And so I took one of their students and supervised his research. And he went on, the point was, he went on to discover a, a male contraceptive, uh, which I've, I've, I've been told has been pretty effective. So he he did, did some did, important did very work. Well, that's yeah. right. And also, you were the first president of the faculty senate there. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very nice. Yes, that came about. Well, it came about after, during the period when there was a lot of student unrest across the country, uh -huh. and uh, there was a big student demonstration, which eventually result, which re resulted in the killing of two students at Southern, and the faculty wow. decided, and the faculty played. A major role in trying to trying to mediate the problems between the students and the administration are trying to serve as the middle the middle group in that group and I, and I was the leader of that under the heading of uh, what was then a faculty advisory council and later that spring after the stu two students had died. Uh, we created a faculty uh, senate, the first one, and I was the overwhelming uh, choice, choice for that for position. It. Wonderful, very good. Then let's talk uh, about uh, Prairie View A and M. You were there for several years. Yes, after okay. as after academic vice president, distinguished professor of chemistry. Right, uh, and by the way, there's a Purdue connection there. Good. Okay. Uh, when I. Uh, in my sixth year at Norfolk State, which is that bridge, I was chair of the chemistry department at Norfolk State, and of course I had no administrative experience higher than that. And uh, so I got a call from the acting president of Prairie View, was Dr. Ivory Nelson, and Prairie View is a part of the Texas A&M system, and Arthur Hansen, former Purdue president, was president of the system. And so, in that regard, I got that's to know him. At the him. time you went there, oh uh, yes, he was there. Okay. Yes, and so uh, he was uh, very, uh, very responsible in, uh, in in my final appointment. But the final appointment was really, Ivory Nelson didn't retain the position of president, and so I was sort of an interim vice president. But Dr. Henson wanted to make me a system distinguished professor so that I could teach at College Station, you know, at the Texas A&M camp at College Station, which he did. He was responsible for, for doing that. And uh, in the process, I earned the distinguished professor. So they sort of came together, you know, the vice president, I was in for only one year, and then the distinguished professorship, which, uh, which I was in for for three years sure. uh, at Prairie View, but it, w it was a very good experience. Good. I, and until, also you were the director of the Title III program? Right, right. Tell us what that entailed. Uh, Title III uh, was a special program from the United States Department of Education uh, designed to improve 
the overall academic climate at a university, but the university had the the right to uh, select which aspects of improvement it wanted to pursue and then from there uh, write a proposal. Now this was all a part of the Higher Education Assistance Act signed by President Johnson, I believe, in 65. Right. And so out of that, out of that uh, legislation came a component called Title III, you know, like Title IX and yes, so on. Right. Okay. And so Title III had as a major emphasis the providing support for historically black colleges and universities who were, in that case, I think, uh, did not have the facilities sure. and other things that the uh, majority institutions had. And so that's what it was about. And so I, Prairie View had a component of that program and I was asked to direct it for three years. Good, well, that was very good. And then I guess next, uh, Texas Southern. Come tell us a little about that and your academic. Vice president right. there, yes. Uh, I, I went there, I went there in uh, 85. Right. Uh, that was the, I was still at Texas a and you know, I had a partial appointment at Texas A&M, and my regular appointment was at Prairie View. And uh, they were uh, a little disappointed because I'd had a good experience right. at Texas A&M sure. and Prairie View. But uh, I got an offer from uh, Texas Southern. Well, I applied for uh, the vice presidency there. Uh, and among uh, 104 candidates, I was the one that was uh, selected. And so I thought that that was a, a good move for me. And so I went there okay. as uh, vice president for academic affairs. What, uh, so you had academic affairs was what it was, and also you did some curriculum reform and uh, did some work with the campus computerization? Uh, you know, well, all yeah. of that was under my leadership okay. there. You know, uh, uh, I, I, I was responsible for bringing uh, academic computing to a new level throughout the campus. Right, okay. And not just in the academic component, campus but throughout wide. campus wide. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, but that was mainly by my own initiative, though, because I've all, I, I had always had an interest in academic computing and it caught on. In fact, at that time, I uh, brought in, I was responsible for bringing in a lot of uh, Apple Macintosh computers. Okay. And so I became known as the Apple Macintosh person. The guru, right? <laughs> and, and by the way, uh, I don't know if you had that in my uh, history, but uh, in 1996, uh, I was one of 15 persons in North America appointed to the advisory board of Apple Computer. That uh, I did not Apple know. Wonderful. Incorporated. So there had been a sort of a history. I didn't want to deviate too much from Texas Southern experience, but it started there when I sort of created an Apple uh, Macintosh environment and uh, it caught on throughout the university. Right. That's so good people thing. in the finance office were using Macintosh. Sure. What was the um, Federal, uh, Frederick Douglass Institute of Liberal Studies? That was. I mean, researchers would be interested in that. Uh, that was. Uh, Again, a part of the uh, desire to to do something about the gaps in knowledge that our undergraduates brought to college, uh, and rather than just simply ignore them and have them to go through an experience where many of them didn't complete college, we decided to create something like uh, uh, it had some of the features of an honors program, sure. uh, but it had broader appeal than just an honors program, or it had a couple of dimensions to it. One was what we call a scholar's opportunity program, which was an honors component. Right. But we also had another component in there designed to 
as I said, fill gaps in knowledge. And, and uh, we had a commitment from faculty from across the university to work with it. I don't want to use remediation because it wasn't that. It no. was more it was a mentoring a program. It was a mentoring program, but it was aimed for the larger student body at some of the deficiencies in basic skills, even though we didn't go back and start re uh, teaching remedial courses. Right. But at the higher level of the institute, as I said, we had a scholars opportunity program, which we call at that time, which had as its main focus getting students ready to be scholars in graduate school. Now we know that all wouldn't go, some would be picked up by industry, but we did those things in the institute that will get that would get them ready. And it focused on on speaking, writing, presentations. Uh, uh, Cultural literacy, a very important right. part of that. Right. In fact, in the Scholars Opportunity Program, uh, students were required to attend two off-campus plays a year. Required. That was a requirement. And the way we required is that they got a, a stipend for it. They were required to at least uh, dine at two international restaurants a year. And that was a part of their development. Okay. So, and they were, and we had a we had a book review series. In fact, during that time, I was able to get uh, Albee, the playwright, who happened to be uh, a writer in residence at the University of Houston, and that was the highlight to have him to come over oh, yes. and speak to our institute. But we, but we, but we had a a book uh, review session, and we reviewed the classics. You know, we just didn't go in and review contemporary books. So all of that was a part of the scholars' Enriching opportunity. Enriching their, their lives. Right, very much so. Right, good, very good. I could have signed up for that. That would be good for me. Then we returned to Southern University. In, in 1989. Right. Uh, they called the, you again. Yes. And this time the it vice, was... Uh, vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. For Academic Affairs. Okay. And the, pers the very person who had nominated me for faculty senate president in 1973 was now the chancellor of Southern University. Okay. And uh, Dolores Spikes, uh, who went on to establish a great reputation in higher education. And she wanted me to apply for the position because I had worked very well with her as co faculty colleagues. And so with that, uh, I did apply. and was appointed. That's very And I stayed in that position for nine years. Okay. Um, the, and you increasing the number of learning opportunities were available to the students and things of that sort. What exactly for the researchers? You handled all of academic affairs as the vice chancellor? Yeah, all, okay. all of academic affairs. In okay. fact, uh, all of the deans Report. reported to me. Okay. Um, and at that time, it, it was it was a very cumbersome, in a sense. I don't mean that too much no. in a negative sense, no. but operation because there were so many people reporting to the office, uh, the registrar, the uh, uh, direction of a uh, director of admissions and recruitment and other other areas. So it was a, it was a big area, and here again. I had a large responsibility for academic computing, so that was that's a big job. That that was uh, since that time, the university has created a different division of technology and network services, but at that time, academic computing was under my direction. Oh, okay, let's talk about uh, some of your synergistic activities. The um, that historical, uh, your black colleges developed a program in interdisciplinary studies. Yes. Now that happened. Uh, that happened under Title III, and it oh, did it okay. happened. Well, it it happened in 1974. Uh, they asked me to come to Washington for a year, and to direct a program in interdisciplinary studies as a part of the overall. Uh, Title III thrust, and so I was really providing leadership for 36 
historically black colleges and universities at that time. Wow. Uh, so I stayed in Washington for a year to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a good experience. good experience. I had always, I had always been projected as being more than a chemist. And so that's how I got into that. They okay. knew that I was interested in in literature. They knew I was interested in, in the arts in general. And so even though I still practice chemistry, right. had a good research laboratory going at that time, sure. which I left in the left in the hands of a graduate student and two very responsible undergraduates okay. uh, when I went to Washington for that, for that year. year. Right, okay. The, um, you were the chairman of that General Research Support Review Committee of the NIH? Uh, that was an honor. Right. In, in 1981, uh, in 1981, I was appointed to the General Research Review Committee okay. uh, by the National Institutes of uh, yeah. Health, and that was in the, what was then the Division of Research Resources. It's now become the National Center for Research Resources, so it's on the level with the other institutes at NIH now, you know, heart, lung, and blood, and so on. And uh, I was in some, some pretty good company there. Uh, uh, the committee itself had the then president of Brandeis University on on the committee, a person who would go on to become the uh, the Food and Drug Administration uh, Commission. And so for me to be selected, I was already on the committee, but for me to be selected as chair was a great honor at that time. Yeah. What was the nature of that general research? We simply report? reviewed proposals, uh, okay. uh, proposals in two, two basic categories. One was uh, biomedical research development in which there were uh, programs at universities that were not known for NIH research, uh, pro programs in pharmacy, in nursing, and in other areas. Uh, and so they were coming in sort of as, as new NIH recipients. And so that was a part of the biomedical research component. And the other part of it was a minority biomedical research component which had been started under the Nixon administ administration, but which was by that time going pretty strong. And so the proposals that came from that component were also a part of the General Research Support Review Committee. Okay. okay. The, um, you were one of the five, five editors of those proceedings for the White House Conference on Science and Technology? Uh, yes. That's uh, very that, nice. Yes. Uh, I think that was in 1988, around that uh -huh. time. A um, couple of other things. Uh, the National League of Nursing uh, Accredi Accreditation Commission were one of the charter members. Right. For, well, uh, for a long time, the National League of Nursing accredited all programs in the United States and it still accredits most of them, sure. regardless of where they're located. But it was done through an accrediting board. And so in 19, I believe, around uh, 95 or so, I was on the commission in 90, I was on the board in 91. So on the, in 95, they elected to make it a commission. Rather than a board. Right, rather than a board. And so in that sense, I was a charter member. Uh, but at, the unique thing about that is that I was also, by 1998, I was also a member of the Regional Accrediting Commission. For the National League? No, no, or for for all universities and the Southern Association. Oh, the Southern Association. Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. So, uh, so I was sitting on two accrediting commissions at that time. One was a specialized commission, which was the National League for Nursing. Right. And another one was the Southern Association, I guess yours would be the Mid-Central. Mid-Central, Mid no. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Are you still with the, uh, on the board for the National League at all? For the no, no, I, I was on as a public member. Okay. And uh, my term, I, I stayed on for eight years, uh, you know, including the sure. board appointment. Right. But uh, my term ended in, I believe, 2001. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. all righty. Um, 
Tell us about that uh, invited lecture for the Pasteur Institute. Uh, nice. In uh, 1978, uh, I applied to uh, a NATO Advanced Study Institute, which was going to be held at the Sorbonne in Paris. And uh, so I, I, I think I was one of 50, uh, maybe 45 persons from around the world invited to participate in that. And that was a three-week uh, advanced study institute. Uh, by the way, while I was there, I uh, reported on some of my research that I had been doing, uh, primarily undergraduate research, at the institute. And so the, the leader of the uh, Advanced Study Institute, uh, Professor Boris Reebok, uh, had some affiliation with the Pasteur Institute and recommended, I think, three or four of our papers to present, be presented there. And so we received that invitation. Oh, nice. That's good. What are you, are you with Southern University at the moment, what, are you still the, an administrator there, or what's your current my, current my My current position is uh, uh, Southern University System Distinguished Professor of okay. Chemistry. Okay. Doing a lot of administrative work. Okay. okay. They, just, they just called on me to, uh, to help uh, complete the uh, self-study our, our self-study for accreditation. Okay. So I spent a lot of time uh, before my surgery working on that. That takes a lot of time. That's right. How about family? Talk, tell us a little about your family. You, know, uh, you have children. Uh, we have uh, we have two children, mm -hmm. uh, both obviously adults, and uh, no grandchildren though. Okay. Uh, maybe maybe. Did there's you board, where did they, are there boys and girls or? Uh, one 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 boy or well, one girl. Okay. Our daughter lives in San Antonio now. And our son lives in Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, not Lafayette, Louisiana, I'm sorry. Lafayette, Louisiana. <laughs> By the way, our daughter was born in Lafayette, Indiana. Oh, okay. When we used to have the regional, you know, airline service, occasionally we'd have people would arrive and they thought they were on the right plane, but it was really Louisiana instead of <laughs> Indiana. And oftentimes we'd have hear stories where the luggage went there instead of here. Sure. <laughs> um, Let's talk a little bit about uh, your awards and honors. Let's start with the College of Science Distinguished Award that you received this spring in April. That was special, uh, right. very special, because th in that award they pick only one chemist a year, and so I was. Uh, it was a very, very nice award. And uh, how did you happen to hear? How did they let you know that you did? Someone call you or? I usually ask people that, or surprised, or how'd you find out, or it varies a little bit. Well, I knew I had been nominated okay. for the award, and uh, I I got a telephone call, and of course followed up with written uh, verification. Sure. Right. But it it I knew that I had been nominated, and I had pretty good credentials. But when you think about all of the chemists, all of the special chemists. Even just in my class, and to be selected from a class of chemists over the years since my time, as well as that, I think in my class we had about 200 who came in. Wow. Uh, it was very big at that time. Sure. Uh, so, and there are a lot of special people in that group uh, that I know of who've done very well, who are CEOs and all of that. And so to think that I was selected from among very, that group uh, to be very this. Very special. Yes, very special right. to me. The next thing is the William E. Moore Distinguished Professor of Earth and Atmospheric Science and Chemistry. And it's the first African American whom a distinguished professor in chemistry has, made, has been named. And Professor Francisco was the. Now, president. that was super special and uh, because, uh, in fact, I, 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 I literally said I had to pinch myself when I, when I, I got the email from. Um, Dr. Vitter, who was the Dean of Science at that time, Jeffrey Vitter, right. uh, when I got the email, I, could, I couldn't believe that because I, I knew that that's an honor that's generally reserved for, for great uh, benefactors, for people who uh, 
are no longer living and, and all of that. So it was just extra, yeah, extra, 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 extra special. Right. And uh, Did, I still get excited about that. When uh, was the first time you met Professor Francisco? I didn't meet him until I came here. Okay. And that, you know, so it wasn't a friendship type okay. thing. Right. He knew of me and I knew sure. of him, but I didn't meet him until I did attend the trustees meeting when the... Oh, did you? Okay. Yes, I was at the trust. It was in this building, I think. That's right. Okay, uh, Stuart, up, upstairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I did attend that, and that was the first time that we physically met. Okay, that's nice. The um, You also received from the chemistry department here the outstanding alumnus. Yes, that was back in uh, uh, 2004, uh -huh. I believe. Uh, and that was... Uh, in that award, they, select, they selected uh, seven of us. To honor, right. and so I was, I was very pleased to be the one of seven that year, and very excited about that. But never did I think that the College of Science would follow that. Oh. And also, the other most recent thing is the Department Advisory Committee, and you uh, for the chemistry. Uh, yes, now that happened in two thousand five. But I'm still on the committee. That's I was right. reappointed. That's right. In fact, in two thousand five. 2006, I became the chair of the committee. Oh, okay. And uh, and then I was reappointed in uh, 2008, I believe, right. for and another right. four-year four appointment. Four years, that's nice. Do they meet? Uh, how once a year. Once a year. Just once a year. Okay, all right. Um, the professional associate, are you was the American Chemical Society, I assume that you're involved, involved yes. with them. Mm -hmm. And was that the National Organization for Professional Advancement of Black Chemists? Now, I'm a member of them, al okay. almost a charter member. I, but uh, Dr. Francisco was the, oh, uh, was the president at, at, at the time, time that the, uh, the William E. Moore Distinguished Professorship was established. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've, I had been a member since 1975. Oh, okay. All righty. Uh, any hobbies or special uh, interests? Any particular hobbies that you have you'd like to share with us? Uh, I, like, I like to play bridge. I don't do a, a lot of it. I did more of it when I was at Purdue, believe it or not, <laughs> and, and shortly thereafter. Sure. Uh, I've played around with chess. I, I'm a sports activist, uh, but spectator sports activist. So I, I, I still deal in uh, trivia. Uh, of course, we have one of our alums is down there with the Saints. Oh, Herbert. of course. I, uh, th th that was one of my uh, trivia questions that I put on Facebook. Uh -huh. uh, which which uh, two universities have had three quarterbacks, three different quarterbacks to win Super Bowls? And, of course, one of them is the University of Alabama, but the other one is Purdue, uh, which Lynn Dawson won a Super Bowl. Right. Uh, Bob Greasy won two, I believe. Right. And, of course, Drew Brees. So I, so I, I, I do follow sp Purdue sports very closely. <laughs> was very disappointed when Humble got injured this year for basketball. Right. He's yes. going to be out of the seat, out for the season. Right. Um, do you have an outstanding event that you'd like to share with us? Or more than one? Sometimes people say, oh, I have more than one. Any comes to mind? Anything special? Outstanding event. Mm -hmm. uh, during the course of my experience at uh, Texas A&M, I was there for two years, I was uh, elected, uh, selected by the students as one of the top teachers in the program. They have a very large chemistry department there. I was selected by the students as one of the top teachers in the program at that time, and I considered that uh, very special. And of course, the Purdue honors uh, the uh, the uh, Joseph. Uh, I mean, the honor with uh, Dr. Francisco, the William E. Moore Distinguished Professorship, is really at the top, right. and uh, the College of Science uh, honor is right up there. So. The honors that I have received uh, from Purdue are, are are very special in my in my life, and uh, uh, I'm I'm very honored that my wife was here right. uh, to support me because she she's stuck with me over that time, and for her to be here too, right. uh, it with makes me. it even better. Yes, right. very much so. Um, 
uh, could you just make a comment on the STEM, uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, and management at Southern University? Uh, so, view to their doing currently, what it, just some thoughts on that. During the uh, when I was uh, academic uh, uh, vice chancellor there, one of the things that I take pride in doing was uh, to uh, to give active support to the mentoring program. Uh, the mentoring program in science and engineering especially. The way that I did that was uh, by giving release time to every department in those areas to provide, uh, to have at least a mentor as a result of having been released from coursework to contribute to the overall mentoring uh, program at the university and certainly to coordinate the mentoring activities in that department. Now, that was important because I knew the value of mentoring in getting students from, say, uh, the undergraduate level at Southern to completing PhD programs across the country. And uh, that mentoring went beyond just simple research advisement, uh, but having actual interactions with students outside of the classroom, outside of the research laboratory, but substantive enough to contribute to their intellectual and personal development so that when they left, they were prepared for perhaps a new type of experience in a graduate program. Uh, the mentoring program that we have, we had and still have, placed great emphasis on getting students into summer programs at other institutions uh, where they can get a feel for that before going. And so the mentoring program or as you refer to it as a STEM program, where STEM simple is just... Uh, right, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, the fields, right. the disciplines, right. Right. It's where we place great emphasis there because we wanted, we wanted more engineers to go on to graduate school. And unless you have that push, like I had from Dr. Vanden White, you may not. You're going to end up at DuPont. Even if you're good, you're going to end up at DuPont or General Electric without that advanced degree. And so we saw the mentoring program as providing that push, but also, as I said, providing for the intellectual development of students beyond what they get right. in the classroom right. uh, or beyond what they would get from just a regular undergraduate experience. Enrichment. Yes. Enrichment, uh, that, that's a good word, uh, right. yes. Uh, in closing, is there something I forgot to ask or I'll leave it up to you if to uh, something you want to end up with or something I, or I may have forgotten to ask, I'll leave it. Well, uh, I've, I've, I've had a great, uh, a great experience. I'm, I'm on leave, uh, medical leave this term, but I, yeah. I plan to return for at least a couple of years. Okay. Uh, uh, I uh, still enjoy teaching. Students still enjoy taking my classes, uh, and I hope it's for the benefit that they uh, get uh, from the experience. But uh, that is very gratifying. Uh, uh, as professors uh, tend to mature, they tend to lose connection with students. Uh, but I, I think I have pretty good connection with students, and so that makes student uh, that makes uh, teaching uh, a very gratifying uh, experience, and certainly an important way uh, to end my active career. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Moore. I appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>